This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Okay, good morning, Rabbi Sai. Baruch Mabon to the Kailal Agar de Pirka here in Two Garden Hills, New York, on a very important day in the calendar. Baruch Hashem, we we will have off. You know, we need more days off to have more time for uh, learning. Okay, um, today's topic, which is uh, the first shear on Sefer Shemais, is not just uh, relevant to Parsha Shemais, not only very fundamental to understanding Sefer Shemais and going down to Mitzrayim and Yetzirah Mitzrayim, but really is one of the fundamental topics in Kala Tarakula and in Chumash in general. And that is, we know, one of the centerpieces of our religion is Yetzirah Mitzrayim. All of the mitzvahs we do, many of the mitzvahs we do, are Zechel Yetzirah Mitzrayim. We know, we know, uh, we make Kiddush, we say Zechel Yetzirah Mitzrayim, we know Tzitzis is to commemorate going out of Mitzrayim, Tfilin, Sukkah, Matzah, Pesach, Mezuzah, Kriya Shema. Most of the mitzvahs we do are in order to commemorate the exodus of Egypt. Why is the exodus so central to our religion? Certainly we're not going to forget it. I mean, you have the tzitzis and you have the tefillin. So again, you walk out of the door and again you make the kiddush. And again, Shabbos, we're being bombarded literally from multiple sources every moment of the day to remember Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. Why is this so fundamental? And let's begin in the following way. Even before the importance of remembering why we left Mitzrayim, let's think for a moment, why did the Yimam Shalom send us down to Mitzrayim in the first place? Why did we go there? It was no less than a Holocaust. We know most of Kla Yisrael did not survive. Chazal tell us, V'chamushim alu b'nei Yisrael me'eretz Mitzrayim. That Kla Yisrael left Mitzrayim one-fifth. By the way, I just want to take the opportunity to uh, thank our good friend Rav Ruben Kolyakov of TorahAnytime.com. Everybody who, if you're not here personally during the shir, you could always tune in and listen to Shirm online. And uh, I think all of us here have gained over the years from Torah Anytime. We give a big yash request. Everyone should really show their support and Tisko uh, Mitzvah. So um, let's try to focus on the fact, why did Rav Sham send us down to Mitzrayim in the first place? Like we mentioned, most of Klai Yisrael did not survive. But what is not so well known is the fact that the Medrash says that it's, it's more than you think. It's not v'chamushim alu b'nei Yisrael me'eretz Mitzrayim. There is an opinion, and if this is uh, on sheet 6 in the second column on the left-hand side, some say 1 out of 5, some say echad mechamishim, 1 out of 50, some say 1 out of 500, and some say 1 out of 5,000. You know, so if 1 out of 5,000 left Mitzrayim, you're talking about tens of millions of people perished. What exactly was the function then of going down to Mitzrayim, why is Rebbe Shalom punishing us for, for 210 years? Both. We're, we're, the, the babies were thrown into the Nile. The babies were built into the buildings. What was the purpose of that? Why is God doing that to us? And Elamai will say, look, there are a lot of tragedies that have happened throughout our history. And we don't always know the reason. Sometimes we say, Dakei Hashem Nistarim, the ways of God are mysterious. But says the Al Shech HaKadosh, and the majority of today's Shir will come from the Al Shech, Rav Moshe Al Shech, who lived from 1508 to 1593, says the Al Shech HaKadosh, a tremendous Yisoyed. If you look at number one, the bottom two lines. V'haloi loi chashed kochabrichu de'avid dina b'loi dina chalila. Heaven forbid that God would administer justice for no reason. And that's something to bear in mind in our own times and throughout history. If you see great tragedy that happens to B'nai Yisrael, to Kla Yisrael, you can't just say, well, we don't understand the ways of God. If God is administering justice and judgment, there's a reason. And we have to try to figure out what is the reason. Why did the Rebbe Hashem send us down to Mitzrayim? Secondly, God, if He needed to punish us, if He needed to uh, administer judgment to us, why Dafka Mitzrayim? Mitzrayim was the most degenerate, most immoral society in the world. Of all the terminologies you could use to describe a country, Mitzrayim is called Ervas Haaretz. You know, think about it. The Medrash says that lands have different parts of the body. You have Hine Haaretz Rachavas Yodayim. Some of the earth has hands. Tabor Haaretz, the earth has a navel. 
Einehara, the earth has many allegorical Eivarim, and yet Mitzrayim is called Erva Sa'aretz. So you could just imagine what kind of degenerate society Mitzrayim must have been. Also, let's try to understand, says the Al Shech HaKadosh, why did Yosef need to go down to Mitzrayim 22 years in advance of the rest of B'nai Israel? Why did he need to go down there? What was he preparing? What was he trying to accomplish? In what way was he setting the table for the rest of Kal Yisrael to go down to Mitzrayim? Okay, Rabbi Yisai, once we're at it, once we're, you know, getting warmed up over here, there are a number of other questions that we want to bring to the forefront to, to, to try to address. These are things that we all know about, but maybe have not, not thought about um, fully. Let's talk a little bit about Avraham Avinu and Sarah. We know Avraham and Sarah did not have children for many years. How old was Avraham when he had his first child? <laughs> Avraham was, uh, well... Yishmael was 86, but Yitzchak was not born until Avraham was 100 years old. And Sarah was 90. Now, extrapolating to our own times, nobody's having their child when they're 100 years old. Most people, by the time they're 100, you know, halavai, we should reach that age. Usually, you know, people need assistance, and everybody knows what it says in the Mishnah and Avais, Ben Meya Shanim Kfar Avar Ubatal. You know, Shkayach. So, <laughs> but, you know, I, we wish everyone, there's a hundred and tzvansig, but uh, at a hundred years old, you know, the, your better days are behind you. You know, your high school picture looks better than the way the person looks at age a hundred. And certainly, people are not fathering children. A woman at 90 years old, it's impossible to have a child naturally. So why did the Rivan Shalom, so to speak, restrain... Avram Avinu, he was Kavash Mayanai, he withheld, he stopped his systems, and they did not start going until he's 100 years old, and Sarah Imenu was 90. But more than that, once a person is 100 years old, the taiva is finished. The Yetzer is finished. The desire is over. In fact, the Medrash Rabbah says in Bereish Rabba, Parsha Memvav, number 5 on your sheets, the Medrash says, Misha Nitzrar Domai. Avram Avinu, his blood had, however, had already coagulated. His Yetzahara was over bottle. His Taiva was over bottle. His whole systems were ended. Avram Avinu was one step in the next world, and that's when he's having a child. Why did the Rosham, why did the Hashkach al orchestrate that that needed to happen? Also, here Avram Avinu, before he has a Yitzchak, he has a Yishmael. He has a creep. You know, why did Avram Avinu have to produce this monster before he produced the Yitzchak? Let's talk about Yitzchak. We know Yitzchak and Rivka also, they didn't have children for many years. And finally, lo and behold, by Yisroi Tzitzu Habon and Bekirva, and who's in the womb of Rivka Imenu? None other than Yaakov and Esav together. Poor man, poor guy, poor Yaakov. He never has to suffer in this confined womb together with the biggest all-time Russia. Basically, he's living with Hitler in the same quarters for nine months. I mean, the Yvon Shem can't give him some breathing room. He has to have him in the same womb with Yitzchak, he met with, with Esau. They're kicking, they're fighting, they're screaming. In fact, the tour writes, you know, it says that, um, what, what were they fighting over? The tour says, wait a minute, they're fighting. Yaakov is a smooth guy. Esau was hairy, and uh, Yaakov's Pasha Itchi. Can you imagine? He's getting pricked by the hair of Esau. So the Yvonne can't give him uh, some, some breathing room. He has to put him in the same confined... It's, be- it's hard enough for a child to be by himself in his mother's womb. Now Yaakov has to be jam-packed together with the great all-time <laughs> Russia, Esau. Why does Yvonne Shum prepare it that way? Ask the Aushach HaKadosh, look at number 7. Begam Tseis Tomei. What's the meaning of this? One of the most astounding midrashim, really a remarkable midrash, very surprising midrash. Chazal tell us that Esau was an admoini, right? He was he was red. Why was he red? Well, you know, why did he look red? There's a midrash. The Alkut Shmoni says the Alshach Hakadosh quotes it number nine. You know why Asa was red? Because he drank red juice. But it wasn't Hawaiian punch. And it wasn't Powerade. And it wasn't Gatorade. You know what Asa drank? Asa drank the Dam Nidus of Sarah. 
Say Chazal. Lama Yatsa Esav Admoini. Why did Esav come out red? Elok Shaya Bevet and Imai. When he was in Rivka's womb, Shasa called Dam Nido Simai. He drank all of his mother's Dam Nida. Says Aushek, what in the world does this mean? He drank the Dam Nida of Rivka? What does that mean? It's not, it's not available. It's not, you know, there's no cap on the Dam Nida that, you know, you could just fill up and drink. Yeah, that's what it says. That Esav drank Rivka's blood. And that's why he was red. You know, you ever, if you feed a baby carrots, you know, a couple of days in a row, they start taking on an orange tinge. They start looking orange. That's when you have to move on to the uh, butternut squash, right? <laughs> so, Esav was red. Why was Esav red? Because he drank the Dam Nida of Rivka Yimenu. What does this mean? Says the Al Sheikh Him Dvarim Oimrim Darshani. This Chazal says nothing less than Darshan me, explain me. How do we explain this Madrash? Also, we know Rabbi Say. We say this every morning. We say Zachar Li Oilam Brisai. God remembered his covenant forever. Davar Tsiva La Eleftar. Something that he commanded for a thousand generations. What does it mean God commanded for a thousand generations? We know the Torah was given in the thousandth generation. Ten generations to Abraham, ten, ten generations to Noach, ten generations to Abraham, six gen, generations to Moshe Rabbeinu. The Torah was given in the 26th generation, and the Torah existed 974 generations before the world was created. So the Torah was given in the thousandth generation. Frek the Al Shechakadosh, what took so long? What was the Rosham waiting for? Why did he hold back the Torah until the thousandth generation? Let's ask some more questions. Before Bnei Yisrael came down to Mitzrayim, it was preceded by seven years of plenty. Then, two years of famine. And Bnei Yisrael walk into Mitzrayim in, after two years of famine. Why? Why did the introduction to Mitzrayim have to be seven years of famine and two years of plenty? What's the meaning of that? Uh, that Klaiso should dafka walk into a country with no food? Why would Hashem arrange it that way? Also, it says that when uh, the Mitzrim, during the years of famine, Yosef took all the Mitzrim and he relocated them. He took the people from the north, he put them in the south, the people in the east, he put them in the west. He relocated all of the, the Mitzrim. Why did he do that? What else did he do to the Mitzrim? He circumcised them. What do they need a circumcision for? They're not Yidin, they're Mitzrim. It's not when the Shem says Neinayach, it's not even better for a Jew to be circumcised. If a, Jew needs, if a non-Jew wants a circumcision, we talk him out of it. There's no point. Why is Yosef circumcising the Mitzrayim? So, Marv Rav Oisai, why did Bnei Yisrael go down to Mitzrayim? The al offers no less than nine interpretations, and probably we all heard all of these interpretations, and he summarily rejects all nine interpretations. So let's go through them very quickly. Look at number 13. Why did the Bnei Yisrael, why were they enslaved, why were they tortured, why were they harmed by the Mitzrayim? Says the al Why? I mean, isn't the obvious reason that every human being has Bechir HaKavsh, has free choice, and the Mitzrim chose, they made the bad decision, to harm us. Everybody knows that a human being has free choice. A human being could choose and make the wrong choice to harm another person. So maybe the Menei Yisrael were just sort of the, uh, the hard luck losers of the bad choice of the Mitzrim. Says the Al Shech of course we know that's not the case. Do you think that Hashem would allow Klai Yisrael to go down to Mitzrayim without any divine providence, without any hashkacha protis? Don't we know that when Klai Yisrael was leaving Mitzrayim, the Tsar of Mitzrayim screamed out, what are you leaving after 210 years? You have 190 years left. What do you mean 190 years left? The, the Tsar of Mitzrayim said, you're supposed to be here longer. What do you mean you're supposed to be here? I thought this was just a bad choice of the Mitzrayim. Elamai, we see, there was some kind of gezera and heavenly decree, and it was preordained from the Rebunisham, that Klal Yisrael needed to go down to Mitzrayim. So to say that we were just subject to the bad choice and the bad Bechira of the Mitzrayim, heaven forbid to say such a thing. So the Al-Sheikh moves on to the next possibility. 
And the next possibility is actually offered by the Ramban. And the Ramban says like this, that when Hashem told Abraham Avinu, Lech Lecha, El Aretz Lecha, El Aretz Lecha, El Aretz Lecha, right? El Aretz Asher Areka. So, the Ramban Shem is telling Abraham, go to Eretz Yisrael. So Abraham Avinu gets to Eretz Yisrael, and what does he find in Eretz Yisrael? Vayihi Rav Baaretz, there's a famine. So what does Avram Avinu do? He immediately packs his bags and he heads down to Mitzrayim. Says the Ramban, Avraham Avinu chata chet gado b'shkaga. Avram Avinu sinned. Why? Because he brought his wife Sarah down to Mitzrayim and he endangered her and he caused her to stumble and he caused her to be taken by Paroi. Ah, he had no food. We mean no food. Have bitachon in God that if God tells you to go to Israel, He'll provide for you there. He'll rescue you there. You there he'll give you food over there. But Avram Avinu leaving Eretz Yisrael and going down to Mitzrayim and endangering Sarah was a chet gadol, was a great sin. And says the Ramban, "V'al hamaisa hazeh nigzar al zaroi hagolos bi Eretz Mitzrayim." You want to know why B'nai Yisrael had to go down to Mitzrayim? Avraham sinned by going down to Mitzrayim, so Klal Yisrael was punished that they were sent to Mitzrayim. Why, says Ramban? Where you sin, that's where you're punished. By the way, the Ramban is not the only one who subscribes to this idea. This is the concept of the Zohar HaKadosh. That Avraham Avinu sinned by going down to Mitzrayim. He sinned by saying that Sarah is my sister. And therefore, Kaisa were punished. They were sent down to Mitzrayim. That's supposed to be a claw or anything? It was a punishment, about yes. Your, about your... What? About your... I don't think one thing has to do with the other. Says, the, 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 says Ramban, <laughs> in the place where Klai, so where Avraham Avinu sinned, that's where they were punished. But the al says, <laughs> but the al says, this is not a correct pshat. Chazal do not agree with this pshat. Because if you look in the Chazal, most notably the Avis Rav Nasan, Avis Rav Nasan says that not only was it not a sin for Avraham Avinu to go down to Mitzrayim, it was one of the ten Nisyoinahs. That after Hashem tells Avraham, leave your birthplace and go down and go to Eretz Yisrael, Avraham Avinu gets there and there's nothing to eat and he has to leave immediately. And according to Avraham Nassim, that's one of the ten tests of Avraham Avinu. So according to Avraham Nassim, it wasn't an Avera, it was a challenge. It was one of the greatest achievements of the life of Avraham Avinu. Plus, the Avraham Nassim lists, the fact that Avraham Avinu had to hide Sarah and say she's my sister was another one of the ten tests. So says the al we can't say that B'nai Yisrael were punished in Mitzrayim because Avram Avinu went down to Mitzrayim and he hid Sarah because according to Chazal, this is not an Avera, this is actually one of the greatest Nesionos of Avram Avinu. But she didn't stay. But she didn't, uh, stay. Which according to Chazal, he passed. He passed. He, he, go, he went. He went, which he was supposed to go because in other words, according to Avram Nelson, he was supposed to go to Mitzrayim he and he was going to die in Eretz Yisrael. Okay. Says the al a third possibility. Maybe the reason why we had to go down to Mitzrayim is because God was going to give us the Torah and we needed a motivation and inspiration to keep the Torah. So Hashem had to show us His might and His miracles. He had to show us the Makos and He had to show us Kriyas Yamsuf and He had to show us His power. You know, Achamishim Laku Bnei Yisrael in Mitzrayim and 200 Alayam. So in order for Klai Yisrael to be able to be Makabal Torah, Hashem had to show us His might. Well, says the al that also doesn't make sense. If Hashem wanted to show us His might, let Him show us His might. What do we have to suffer for, for 210 years? But even more than that, think about it. The first generation, they were tortured. The second generation, they were tortured. The third generation, they were tortured. And the fourth generation, they saw the might of God. So just think about it. The, na- the first generation, who were they? They were harassed. They never saw God's might. The same they were harassed. And the fourth generation, who grew up uh, unsubjugated to the midst room, they're the ones who saw the might of Hashem. And, and the, the first three generations had to suffer for nothing, so that the fourth generation, who didn't even need to see the might of God because they never tortured in the first place, they're the ones who are going to see the power of Hashem. It's not mistaber to say that Hashem only tortured us in Mitzrayim in order to be able to show us His power if the generation that was harassed 
was not even the generation who saw the power of Hashem. Well, says the Alshech, there are many other possibilities here. It seems he builds up strong. Another possibility, yeah, he's making a very strong case. Another possibility is that maybe we had to go down to Mitzrayim as a punishment for Mechiras Yosef. Like the Pasuk says in Amos, Al Michram, Ba'kesef, Tzadik. Because they sold the Tzadik for cash. Or maybe, says the Al Sheikh, it was a punishment that we lied to Yaakov Avinu and we took the Ksain as Pasim and we dipped it in blood and we told Yaakov Avinu, Haker no, do you recognize this? Or maybe another possibility, well, I personally, uh, not clear what this possibility is. If anyone has an explanation, we'd be glad to hear it after. But somehow we fell into the bird trap of Yosef. What trap? We didn't have food. And we had to go down to Mitzrayim, and we needed the food. And when we went for the food, we got stuck there, and we got stuck in the bird trap. Nice. Says the Al Sheikh, none of these three possibilities are correct either. Yet Mitzrayim was not a punishment for Mechiras Yosef, it was not a punishment for lying to Yaakov Avinu, and we did not get stuck in any trap. And do you know how I know these are not true? Because the beginning of Sefer Shemois. The words of the Psukim exclude any possibility of saying that it was a punishment for Mechiras Yosef. Why? Because oh, the book opens up, And let's think about some of the names. Who are some of the names? Ruvain! We open up with Ruvain! Ruvain. Ruvain has nothing to do with Mechiras Yosef. So it's saying, these are the names of the children of Israel who came down to Mitzrayim. And I want you to know, to be clear and understand why we came down to Mitzrayim. It could not have been because of Mechir Yosef. Because look at the first name, Reuben. Reuben has nothing to do with anything. Binyamin. Binyamin has nothing to do with anything. So obviously we're not being punished for Mechir Yosef. If it was Mechir Yosef, why would the Torah emphasize names of people who had nothing to do with the sale? Names of people who do not present to Yaakov Avinu the Ksenes Pasim. It can't be, says the Al Sheikh, that it was a punishment for Mechir Yosef. Because think of the words. It says, "Ve'eles shemois v'neisal haba Mitzrayim." Eis Yaakov, who came down to Mitzrayim, the brothers. It doesn't even say they were the main main ones who went out, who came down. It says Yaakov, and by the way, the children also. Now, if going down to Mitzrayim was a punishment for selling Yosef, why would the Torah <coughs> say primarily Yaakov went down? And the other kids came along with him. If it was because of the sale of Yosef, then why would Yaakov have been the main one who went down? Says the Aushach, you know, the Gemara says other possibilities. For example, look at number 19. The Gemara Nadarim offers a number, uh, an- another three possibilities. Amar Rabbi Avo, Amar Rabbi Laza. Mipnei ma nenash Avram Avinu v'neshtabdu banav l'metzrayim masayim v'eser shanim. Why was Avram Avinu enslaved and his children... Why was Avram punished and his children were enslaved 210 years? Mipnei shenasa angariya v'tamidei chachamim. Because he used yeshiva brachrim in his army. You're not to draft yeshiva brachrim into the army. And if you draft Torah scholars into the army, you have to suffer in Mitzrayim for 210 years. Sorry, I can't be apologetic. This is what God tells us in Talmud Babli. That the reason why we went down to Mitzrayim is because Avram Avinu draft Yeshiva Bachram into the army. What can I tell you? I can only tell you the truth. Another pshat. Shmuel. Because Avram Avinu complained against God's attributes. He said, God, prove to me that I'm going to inherit Eretz Yisrael. Now this is Mamish, Mavel al Arayan. Rabbi Yochanan Omar, Shehifrish b'nei Adam l'ikana istachas kamvishin. Avram Avinu didn't do Kirov. That's why we went down to Mitzrayim. He didn't do Kirov. He didn't do Kirov. No, the Gemara says because he did not. N-O-T, big capital. N-O-T. He didn't do Kirov. Oh, wait a second. Avram Avinu is the paragon quintessential Makar When they have, you know, the, the project, uh, the, the weekend, you know, with the Kirov, 
Avram Avinu, they have different pictures. His was the biggest. Avram Avinu was the greatest Makariv Rechaikim in history. The Rambam says Avram Avinu is Makariv more than 10,000 people. Ha! Ah, but he didn't do enough. Why not? Because one time, the Melech Sadoim says, Ten li hanefes or chush kachlach. I'll give you the money, you take, and I'll, uh, I'll give you the money, I'll take the people. Avram Avinu should have said, no, no, you take the money, I'll take the people. I could be Makariv more people. This is a very frightening Gemara because people, we like to rest on our laurels. Let's say somebody who learns a lot. They think, oh, I learned so much. I learned more than anybody else. Yeah, but if there was a time you could have learned more, you could be nailed for it. Let's say somebody said, oh, I give the most tzedakah. It doesn't, there's no, it's no comparison. It's not a competition of who does the most. It's do you do everything you could do? If you could give more tzedakah, if you could learn more, if you could do more mitzvahs. Avram Avinu, the greatest makari v'chaykim in the history of the world, is being punished severely because he could have done a little bit more. Bottom line is, the al what does he have to say about all of these nine possibilities while we went down to Mitzrayim? Eh. Nah, he doesn't buy it. And in order to answer this question, the al asks one more question. In Parshas Vaschanan, which is such a beautiful parsha, it's my Hamzim, my, my Bar Mitzvah parsha. Ve'eschem lokach Hashem. And you, God, took. Vayoitzi eschem, and I took you out, mikor habarzel, from the iron furnace, mi Mitzrayim. What is Mitzrayim called? The Kor HaBarzal. Flek the Aushech Lama Nikra Mitzrayim Kor HaBarzal. Why was Mitzrayim called the Iron Furnace? And now we come to one of the central ideas in Jewish thought. And hopefully, B'Siyata Deshmaya, we could explain it properly. In order to understand the role of Mitzrayim and the role of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim and the role of Mitzvahs and the role of the giving of the Torah, this is one of the central ideas in Jewish thought. And that is, let's try to get an understanding of who Adam Harishon was in Gan Eden before he sinned. And who better do we have to go to than Rav Moshe Chaim Lutzato, one of the greatest masters of Jewish thought. And Rav Moshe Chaim Lutzato in the Sefer Das Tfunais gives us a little picture of the greatness of Adam Harishon before the sin. Yeah? Everybody with me? Everyone up to it? Was a late night last night? What's going on? You didn't sleep well. The what heat was too hot. Up? What? What brought that up? Right? Was it right? Up? Maybe we should tur- tur- put on the air conditioner or something. The game was over yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Bar Hashem. Hakol there. Yeah. So, um, the Ramchal writes like this: Ki kaidem chayd adam arishain. Before the original sin. Look at number twenty-two. Hine adam. Man was crowned with crowns of sanctity to the point where the Malachi Asharis looked at Adam and they thought he was God. The Malachi Asharis looking down from Shemayim, they took a look at Adam and they said, Wow, this is God. Bikshu Loi Marshira. He had such clear knowledge of God. He was so sanctified. Literally, his, the ball of his ankle illuminated like the sun. He was so holy and so sanctified that he literally, the angels, with their discerning seichel, they did not, be, they, could, they thought he, this was the Reba However, says Ram Khan, the last four lines, when Adam sinned, not only did he not profit what he could have profited, and it, and risen up higher and higher, he lost what he, what he had. And he was lowered. And he was compared now, he now became an Adam Hashafal, like the Pasuk says in Tehillim, Adam Bikar Balyolin Nimshal Kabahimais. Adam Arishain was, then went, Mibira Rama, Meigra Rama, Labira Amikta. He went from the highest pinnacle to the lowest pit. Instead of being someone who the angels thought was God, literally became like an animal. Nimshal ke behemois. Now let's explain that. What does it mean Adam Arishan became like a behemoth? So I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that the Ramchal writes in possibly his most important sefer, the sefer Adi Bamaray, 
that the Ramchal says a Dover Mavel Arayan, by the way, the Taz and the Divrei David and Parshas Bereshia says the same thing, that the Behemois and the times of Adam Arishan before the sin were like human beings are today. In other words, and a human being today is like an animal koidem the chait. In fact, Chazal say that Adam Arishan lived with all the Behemois and the Chayas in Gan Eden. So the Maral says that's Davar Metuav Mechayor. What a disgusting thing! Adam Rishon lived with all the animals, and the Taz says, "What's the problem? The animals back then were like human beings today." But be it as it may, if you wanted to know, if you wanted to know the difference between us, the difference between Adam today and Adam back then is much bigger difference than Adam today and the Behemoths today. We plummeted. We fell. Very greatly. Now, what caused this? How did, we, how did we plummet? Now, let me just explain. That means spiritually the neshama was downgraded. The body was downgraded. The body was not sanctified as much as it once was. We were once clearly divine beings and now we've become physicalized. What happened? What downgraded mankind? This is what the Gemara in Shabbos calls... The Nachash came to Chava, he literally involved himself in physical relations with Chava, and he injected in her Zuhama. What does Zuhama mean? Grime, poison. Literally, in, in Lashon HaKodesh, Zuhama means as follows. If you have a chillin pot, but not the kind that they have now, with the crock pot, with the nice plastic inline, and all. your grandmother's pot, the way the, the, the Baba made the cholent, when she made a real cholent, and it sat on for 24 hours. And then after Shabbos was over, you know what's on the bottom of that pot? It, it's, it's black, it's charcoal. It ain't ever coming out. It's just grime. She has to soak it in soap until Mishabbos had Shabbos to get it out. That's Zuma, that's grime. The Nachash injected in Chava grime. And that downgraded mankind, it downgraded Chava, it downgraded Adam, it downgraded the animals. Adam, Adam then shrank physically, spiritually, in every dimension. Mankind was downsized. Instead of man being divine, mankind now is almost nimshalu kebehima. We're compared to an animal now. But ultimately, we did rid ourselves of the Zuhama. Because Chazal tell us, that why do Jews, why are Jews purified from Zuama and the Gentiles still have Zuama? The Gemara says like this in Masech the Shabbos, Kuf Mem Hei to Kuf Mem Vav. Look at number 25. Klal Yisrael Sha'amdu al Har Sinai Paska Zuhamasan. When the Jewish people stood at Mount Sinai, we rid ourselves, we expunged ourselves of the of the poison of man, the poison that was injected into us by the snake. But the Gentiles, who did not stand on Harsinai, they still are full of this grime. So graphic. Thank you. <laughs> and the Gemara says, actually, the Gemara says, I do my best, right? The Gemara says that, <laughs> a, a further Mandamra of Abba Bar Kahana says, that it actually took three generations, from Avraham to Yitzchak, to Yaakov, to expunge all that filth and grime that the Nachash injected in us. Well, let's explain this a little bit more. Let's explain this um, in, the, in the theology, in the Machshava of the Ramchal. The Ramchal writes in the Darach Hashem, look at number 26, Yitzias Mitzrayim Hayatikun Gadol. Yitzias Mitzrayim was a great rectification. Sheniskenu Ba Yisrael. That Klal Yisrael was rectified. Vinishar Hadavar Lonetzach. And this rectification lasted forever. I'm going to blend it now together with the words of the Alshech. Let's begin in the following way. Adam Arishon sitting in Gan Eden. He's in paradise. He's literally like a god. To the point where the angels cannot differentiate between him and the Riban Shalom. And the angels were barbecuing for Adam Rishon. The angels were bringing him wine. And what was he doing? He was immersing his mind in knowledge of God. 
and elevating himself level after level after level and clinging to God closer and closer and closer, he was going to come to the Tikkun HaAchrayim very quickly. But then the Nachash injected in Chava this poison and mankind was downgraded forever. But the Rebbe Shalom said, you know what? I'm going to give one more chance. I'm going to give mankind another opportunity to go back and reach the level of Adam Arishan before the Chet. Now, who would be able to do it? Anybody. Anybody could do it. Any tzaddik could stand up and say, that's it. I'm going to be the next Adam Arishan. I'm going to cling to God and restore the level of mankind to the level that it was on before the sin. I'm going to be the great tree and from me all of my descendants and all of my branches are going to branch out to, re, to rehab the ability to be on the level of Adam Rishon before the Chet. And the Ramchal writes, if you look in number 29, that God, whenever He gives opportunity, the opportunity is capped. There's always a statue of limitations. Nobody has unlimited opportunity. Lamashal, even us in this world, it's only as long yes. as that candle burn, burns. We in this world, thank you. It's only as long as that candle burns. As soon as the neshama departs, the statue of limitations has ended. Even God, with His tremendous chesed, gives a limited opportunity. And God's opportunity that He gave was until the Zman Haflaga. And comes the Zman Haflaga, and there were many tzaddikim, chanoich, mesushelach, shem, and ever, and they all tried to, so to, so to speak, be that Elon Gadol, that great tree from which um, the new Adam, the original Adam, would revert back to the level that he was on, Kaidem Hachet. However, none of them succeeded in reaching that level with the exception of one man. One man stood up and he said, I will be that Adam. I will be Adam Hagadol Ba'anokim. I will be the great man who will be that. You see, the original plan of creation was there will be Adam Arishon, and all the descendants of Adam Arishon would always have the ability to reach that great level. But when Adam Arishon sinned, God had to do take two, and then many generations went, and only one man got up and said, I'm going to be that man from who the new Adam will come. And that man was Abraham Avinu. And all the other nations, so to speak, faded into oblivion. If you want to know, what is the role of a non-Jew in the scheme of history? Yes, they could have a share in the world to come, but compared to the Jew... They are merely grass, and we are the great tree. Now, they are not doomed to any punishment, and they have availability to join our people, and even if they don't join our people, they could keep the seven mitzvahs b'nei noach and receive oilam haba. But what is not available to them, that's the difference between Judaism and every other religion. Every other religion, if you're not one of them, you're, etern- you're doomed to eternal Gehenna. By us, no. You don't have to be a Jew. You could believe in God, keep minimal mitzvahs and have a share in the world to come. However, what is not available to them is that the Gentile can never reach the level of Adam Arishan before the Chet, only we can. However, Avram Avinu stood up and you see that big tree in the back over there? Don't look, take my word for it. It's a very tall tree. That's Avram Avinu. And if you want to be part of that tree and be someone who could pluck Climb and scale the heavens and reach the level of the reason for the sin. Either you need to be a descendant of Abraham or you need to graft yourself onto that tree. That's why Gerus is called Venivrechu Vecha Komishbuchas Adama, Lashon Brecha, a grafting. That's why Gerum are called a grafting. Any human being has the right, if his heart um, is generous and his heart um, inspires him, he could get up and say, I would like to graft myself onto the great tree of the Jewish people. But only if you're a part of that tree could you be eligible for the greatness of Adam Arishan before the Chet. And Avra, yeah, but here's the problem. Because we still have that Zuhama, we're still sullied and poisoned by the dirt and the grime and the filth of the snake of the original sin. 
So Hashem says, and now here's where the Al Sheikh, until now, what I just said, that segment comes from the Ramchal and the Dark Hashem. Here's where the Al Sheikh comes in. Avram Avinu, as great as he was, as towering of a tree as he was, he still is not immune to the filth of the original sin. So God says, We have a problem over here. You still got some zuama. You're not going to be able to reach that level so that all your descendants forever and ever will be eligible. So you know what we got to do? You need to expunge the filth in you. So don't have a bris milah yet. Huh. Keep all the mitzvahs. Make sure you have an arla. And then what you're going to do is you're going to vomit out whatever filth you have inside of you. You have a lot still. And you're going to vomit it out into the biggest creep who ever was born. Yishmael. Yishmael was whatever Zuama was still left in Avram Avinu. He gathered it together and he belched it out into the creep of Yishmael. If you want to know what's Yishmael, Yishmael, imagine a hundred chillin' pots with grime and, and grit and gather it all up into one blob. That's Yishmael. He likes this example. I like that example. But Avram said, please, I, I can't do it in Sarah. So Hashem said, no, I have Hagar. You'll do it in Hagar. <laughs> Hagar comes from Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim, they're a bunch of kizirmas, susim, zirmasim. They're a bunch of horses anyway. So you'll get it out in her. But make sure to get it all out. Don't have the bris milah yet. So Aram Vinu maintains the Arla. And he expunges mamish, ruba de ruba de ruba of his filth. And he belches it out into Hagar. And that's what Yishmael is. Then Hashem says, okay, Avraham. Your blood has coagulated, and your Yitzhahara is come out dead, and your Taiva is come out dead, and you're ready come out in the oil of my MS. Now it's time to have a pure descendant. If you had even an inkling of human desire left in you, then there might be a Pagam in your child. So we're going to wait until you're already one foot into the next world, and then you're going to have Yitzchak. Tremendous insight. Tremendous. Thank you. Thank you. I'll pay you later, okay? And, but here's the problem. Here's, here's the problem. There's still a little bit left in Yitzchak. So Yitzchak says, Rebbe what do you want from me? I can't marry a Hagar like Avram did because I'm an Oila Tamima. So Shem says, oh, we have a dilemma over here. Because if you're just going to give birth, then every child you give birth to is going to have a little bit of Zulama left. So the only Yitzchak is... You're only going to have one good child. But at the very moment you have a good child, you have to have simultaneously a Russia so that the child will remain pristine and whatever filth will come out will come out not in the good child but simultaneously in the Russia. That's Pshad and Yaakov and Esau. Says the al And whatever Zuhama and Grime was left in, y- in Rivka... Esav was drinking it up. That's the meaning of Esav drank the Dam Nida of Rivka. Because uh, Rabbi Bachai writes that the menstrual cycle is a result of the original sin. Original sin is a Christian word. It's a Christian no. word. Original sin. No, the original sin is an English word. Original, you can look up in the web. It's the same No, but it's a different type of sin. I don't know about that. The primordial sin. What? So you're not referring to Christological. No, no, no. The first sin. Wasn't the Makar the yeah. four Golas in the yeah. Prayim? No, that's where it goes out Christianity. Yeah, um, that, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, Mitzrayim, the Rizal says that the four Golias are... Uh, Mitzrayim is the, the Av of all, all the four Golias. But the concept being, one second, is that um, Yitzchak and Rivka still had a minimal amount of Zuhama left in them. And that's why Yaakov and Esau had to be born simultaneously with Esau drinking up the Dam Nidus of, of Rivka. And now Yaakov Avinu has four, has 12 children. All the children were all perfect tzaddikim. But yeah. says the Al I, I love this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Tell me. But I have to go. <laughs> 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 says, says the Al Sheikh. You going to Israel? Says the Al Sheikh. At this point in time, the Zuhama in Klal Yisrael is so minuscule that a human being is not able to expunge it. And the, the difficulty and the sar and the pain and the torture of Mitzrayim was a kor habarzel, was an iron furnace that literally burnt out and melted out whatever semblance of Zuhama was left in Bnei Yisrael so that Klal Yisrael would be able then 
they still weren't perfect yet because they had to count 50 days until they stood on Harsinai. But Yitzias Mitzrayim was kimat what? Purified Klal Yisrael, not for then, but even for today. When we say the bracha, Ata gibar li oilam Hashem mechaye meisim ata. There, Yibam Shem, one day you will revive the dead, and we will get up and walk back into the Garden of Eden, and be on the level of other reason for the sin. That's us, not the Yumois Oilam. What allowed that to happen? Yitzias Mitzrayim. Yitzias Mitzrayim burnt out of Klal Yisrael. Us, me, you, our ancestors. Without Yitzias Mitzrayim, we would not have that eligibility to reach the level of other reason before the sin. Says the Ramchal, very interesting, going back to number 26, that until Matan Torah, even though Abner Avinu stood up to be that tall tree, God gave one last window of opportunity for any nation to stand up and say, yes, we also want to be a tall tree. That's why God offered the Torah to all the Umay Sa'ilam. But at Har Sinai, for eternity, God selected only the Jewish people to be eligible to reach the level of Adam Arishan before the sin. We have eligibility for Trias HaMesim. We have eligibility for eternal greatness only because of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. Says the Ramchal, every time you do a mitzvah, be it tzitzis, be it tefillin, be it kiddush, be it Shabbos, be it sukkah, and you say the words, Zecher Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, you're remembering your eligibility for the greatest madrega of the level of other Mishim Kan Machet, but even more than that, every time you do a mitzvah, you strengthen that possibility, you maintain that possibility, you're mechazek that possibility, and you strengthen your neshama that one day it will reach the level of other Mishim Kan Machet. Meaning, a mitzvah that you do is giving you the eternal kayach for the neshama to be restored to the level of Adam HaRishayin, Kaidam HaChet. It's half love of fellow. That's the purpose of Mitzrayim. The purpose of Mitzrayim is to melt out the spiritual impurity that existed in the neshama of a Jew that makes us eligible for eternal greatness. You know, if you ever think about it, I still, I'm, I'm not done. It's, brace yourself, brace yourself. Yeah, this is more important. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, have a seat, have a seat. Sit, sit, sit. Sit, sit. Don't worry, relax. Okay. So, if you look at the, the name Adam, if you look at the name Adam, what does Adam mean? The Gemara says, the, the Pasuk says, Kimin Adam, right? What? He was taken from the earth. That would seem like a very low name for Adam Arishain. He's created from the earth. Here, this, this individual who has the possibility of reaching the level of being a Kadosh, we call him Adam Kimina Adam Alukakta. The Shla Kadosh and the Ramami Pano says the word Adam, Adam has a duality of meaning. If we're not Zoicha, Kimin Adam Alukakta, then we're just a piece of dirt. But the word Adam also has another meaning. There's a pasuk, Adam Elyon. I am comparable to God. This is d- the duality of the meaning of Adam. If we sink, like Adam Rishon sin- uh, sank before the Chait, we sank to the level of Ki Mino Adam Alukata. But we also have in us the potential of Adam Elyon, the potential to reach the level of Adam Rishon before the sin, where the Malachi Ashuris look at a human being. And they almost can't distinguish between an Adam and the Almighty. Says the Aushach HaKadosh. This is the explanation of the, the transition of history. Where God understood that, listen carefully, God understood that He could not give the Torah right away. Because if He gave the Torah right away, we still had too much grime in us. And He had to wait for an Avram Avinu to stand tall. And then to, for him to remove his Zuama with Yishmael. And for Yitzchak to remove his Zuama with an Esav. And for us to suffer in Mitzrayim and to come out pure. And only then, he says an amazing thing. That really the Torah should have been given after a thousand generations. But Hashem saw that if he would wait for a thousand generations, we would not be able to expunge properly. So he condensed it. 
and he waited 974 <coughs> generations before the world was created. And the first 10 generations didn't really do anything. And the second generations, and in the last six generations before the Torah was given, whatever needed to be accomplished was squeezed into that period of time. Mamish Hafla fella. We had to go down to Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim <coughs> sucked out of us whatever Zuama we still had left. Why is that? Like we mentioned, every land is compared to a different Avar. Some lands are, have Enayim, Tabur, Yadayim, Raglayim. Mitzrayim is called Erva. If it's called Erva, you could just imagine how degenerate it is. It's on the 50th level of Tumah. And it literally was Shoye from Kali, so whatever minuscule Zuama we had left in us. But Hashem said, you know what? It's very dangerous. Because if you go down to Mitzrayim, you're in danger of plummeting. You're in danger of going lost. So I need to pave the way for you. So 22 years before you go down to Mitzrayim, 22, communion, the letters of the Aleph days, I'm going to send down a Yosef HaTzadik. And Yosef HaTzadik, his specialty was overcoming Taiva. And Yosef's going to go down to Mitzrayim and he's going to be tempted by the strongest temptation any man ever had to face. He's going to be tempted by Eishas Poitifera. And she says, um, She says to him, yimi. And when Yosef overcame that temptation, You know what Yosef did? He took the erva of Mitzrayim and he circumcised the erva. By overcoming that Nisayon, Yosef weakened the Tsar of Mitzrayim. But still, it was going to be very difficult for us to go down to that land. So Hashem said, you know what? If Klai goes down to that land, and they're being satiated and fed by the ministering angel of Mitzrayim, we're going to be influenced by the angel of Mitzrayim. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to kill Mitzrayim. They're going to have seven years of plenty, Yosef's going to gather everything into his storehouse. And then, literally, the land will not produce one morsel of food. From now on, every morsel, every barley corn that anybody eats is not from the Tsar of Mitzrayim. It's from the hand of Yosef. And every morsel of food that Klai Yisrael were nourished in Mitzrayim was from the hand of the Tzaddik of Yosef. This way, Klai Yisrael didn't have to be affected by being nourished from the Tsar of Mitzrayim. And even more than that, the Mitzrim were weakened. Why? Because Yosef takes them, he really relocates them everywhere. So now the center force and the power of Mitzrayim was completely obliterated. And then Yosef circumcises them all, weakens their taiva. This way, Kal Yisrael would be able to get out, at least with some semblance of Kedusha, and leave Mitzrayim prepared forever to reach the level of Adam Arishain before the Chet. Says the Al Shech HaKadosh. If you want to know why B'nai Yisrael had to go down to Mitzrayim, the answer is, U B'nai Yisrael paru vayishritzu. Because we were filthy, we were dirty, we needed to be expunged from the sheretz, from the filth of the original sheretz of the Nachash HaKadmoni. And this way, we expunged our filth after an Abraham got rid of a Yishmael, after Yitzhak got rid of an Esau, after the crucible of the Kor HaBarzel of Mitzrayim, says the al this is the seminal explanation for why Mitzrayim was necessary, why it's fundamental to Jewish history, why it's fundamental to every mitzvah we do. The Ramchal writes, every time a person is mechavein, zecher litzias Mitzrayim, I want to read to you, you should remember these words in number 26, on the bottom paragraph. This was a rectification that we were rectified forever. All benefits that God bestows on us are all dependent on Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. That's why we're commanded to remember it forever. Always, every minute of the day, a person has to have their mind on their potential to reach the level of Adam Arishan before the sin. By doing this, that tikkun is strengthened. In other words, it's not enough that Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim. It needs to be remembered daily, hourly, by the minute. 
Because every time you remember Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim, it strengthens your eligibility for eternal greatness. Says the al this is the meaning of the Korah Barzal, and Merz Hashem, we should talk all bizoicha to that Tikkun Ha'achroin, to the Ketz Hayomim, when we're all Nenem Izev Ashkina, Sadikim, Yoishvim, Atrasem, Veroshayim, Nenem Izin Ashkina, Vihi Chalkeinu Iman. Shkayim. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.